हेलो फ्रेंड्स वी आर गोइंग टू सी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट चैप्टर इन द अपर लिम्स एनाटोमी एंड आई कैन अश्योर दैट दिस इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट चैप्टर्स इन द एनाटोमी बिकॉज दिस इज रिपीटेडली आस्क इन द एग्जाम एग्जाम पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू दिस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट चैप्टर यू कैनॉट मिस आउट द ब्रेकियल प्लेक्सेस दैट नेटवर्क प्लेक्सेस दैट नेटवर्क ऑफ नर्व्स which are supplying your upper limbs and that is brachial plexus very very important and many of the times you can go through your question papers and you will find that this is repeatedly asked in the exams so where it is located we have to see in our body we have previously seen there is something called as axilla in the axilla the main content is axillary artery axillary vein and the brachial plexus so this is where you have the brachial plexus located and you can see i have diagrammatically shown here the vertebral column containing this spinal cord and how the nerves come out of that spinal cord to supply different regions of our body if you observe in the axilla there is a network of these nerves which are supplying the upper limb and they form a particular pattern and that is called as brachial plexus so what kind of pattern they follow how they are arranged what are their parts this is what we are going to see in today's lecture now observe now observe in our body the spinal cord is where you have all the spinal nerves arising and you must be remembering that it has a gray matter it has a white matter gray matter is inside white matter is outside and the nerves come out of the gray matter the neurons which forms the nerve come out of that gray matter we are going to see how the nerve is formed because this chapter basically deals with the nerves that supply your upper limb and the pattern of formation of the nerves that network which is formed by the nerve is known as the brachial plexus which is for the upper limb and you can observe in this case it is located in the axilla and how it proceeds to supply the upper limb notice here that they actually begin in the neck you know from the spinal cord which is there in the neck and the upper part of the thorax so essentially they have the nerves arising from the neck and the spinal cord and then they proceed in a peculiar way to finally go and supply as a terminal branches into the upper arm or the we'll say the upper limb so this is your brachial plexus which is a network of nerves that supply the upper limb okay see the word itself what does it indicates the brachial means it is something related to the arm and here we can take a white term that is called as upper limb so this is a plexus that is a network i am repeatedly telling you this is a network of nerves that supply your upper arm and this is a prototype this only tells you that how these nerves are arranged in a particular pattern say spinal cord have the roots of the nerves arising from it they unite they again redistribute themselves and they supply the muscles of the upper limb and these muscles of the upper limb obviously are supplied by different nerves some will be supplied by say median nerve some will be supplied by a radial nerve some will be supplied by ulnar nerve these three are the major nerves and how they are formed pardon me how they are formed okay so this is how you get something called as brachial plexus many of the times people don't understand what it is made for it is just made for the supply of your upper limb the nerve supply how you control how you move your upper limb and this is the purpose of your brachial plexus but surgically also this is very important 
because it is located in the neck it is located just behind the clavicle it is also located in the some part is located in the axilla as well so huge portion is you know is in uh, spread for this brachial plexus so brachial plexus is not only in the axilla it is a continuation of the nerves from the ne neck behind the clavicle and into the axilla and that is why it is surgically is also important because you have to know which nerve supplies which area from where it goes down any important structure related to that that is why this particular chapter becomes very important we'll proceed in a way to know what is a brachial plexus we'll also see how it is formed we'll also see what are the parts of that brachial plexus we'll also see some of the relations of the brachial plexus we'll see the branches of the brachial plexus we'll see important short note which is repeatedly asked over that topic again and again herbs paralysis herbs point what is that okay and there is also a part of applied anatomy and we are going to see few of the applied anatomy points throughout the session because you cannot get over you know into this session without knowing the few of the clinical scenarios so before proceeding to the main topic let us understand the basics of the formation of the spinal nerve how it is related to our brachial plexus because the beginning of the brachial plexus we can see it is in the spinal nerve root so you have to know what are those nerve roots exactly which kind of fibers they contain and why it is necessary to know that because unless you know the spinal nerve it is very highly you know unlikely that you will understand the brachial plexus so every book essentially mentions the spinal nerve and its formation in this and many of the times anatomy teachers teach this only in this chapter you may not again you know see the details of formation of the spinal nerve in the neuroanatomy in the brain uh, they may tell in the initial chapter but it may be skipped you know depending on the the pace of the syllabus and all but remember this is the best time to understand it okay so we'll see how the spinal nerve is what is that how it is formed does it divide any particular division of that spinal nerve of notice noticeable importance and what are the parts in the area supplied by the spinal nerve so yes we'll uh, proceed to that so what are the parts of spinal nerve okay just go through this slide and we'll see a very good schematic diagram that will help you to understand the topic again so spinal nerve formation these two roots are the important okay ventral root and the dorsal root what is a ventral root it is a motor root means this has the fibers that are able to move your muscle cell or any effector organ that are carrying impulses from the central nervous system to that organ these fibers are known as motor fibers those fibers that carry the information from your cns towards the organs that are need to be activated or need to be you know under the effect for some or other kind of stimuli so they are motor fibers and this ventral root which is on the front side of your spinal cord they arise from the front side or the anterior ventral aspect also known as ventral root of the spinal cord dorsal root is the sensory root and that is bringing the information towards your brain and the spinal cord so this root is very important okay because without sensing anything you will not be able to give the appropriate motor response and these two roots are together in a spinal cord spinal nerve so these two roots unite to form your spinal nerve and in some areas where there is autonomic fibers there is a separate system called as autonomic system in your body this get additional fibers of that autonomic 
nuclei which are there in the spinal cord in the thoracic and the lumbar region those are sympathetic neurons and for the upper limb these are important okay because in the brachial plexus you get sympathetic nerve fibers at times okay and your upper limbs definitely need some sympathetic control as well but what kind of fibers there and clinically what scenarios you may get for that fibers you will understand slowly but remember a spinal nerve has three components for that two are major one is minor at times present it may not be present in all the nerves okay but just see ventral root dorsal root and third root we can add is the autonomic root then all these together contribute to the spinal nerve it's clear they can further divide after union of all these fibers you know again they divide they form ventral and dorsal rami rami is a branch ramus means a branch and they are mixed in nature now we cannot say the ramus as motor or sensory or autonomic they have almost all the three kinds of the fibers and that is why we call them as the mixed okay in the case of the upper limbs they are mixed only ventral rami contributes to the plexus formation i am repeating the ventral ramus forms the plexus okay because the dorsal ramus supplies your back muscles okay and in the upper limb in the lower limbs so the limb portion which are supplied by the plexus is they generally don't carry the fibers of your posterior ramus of the spinal nerve so you have to just delete from your memory temporarily that the dorsal ramus of the spinal nerve do not contribute it does not contribute so delete that ramus so we are mainly and exclusively dealing in this chapter with the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve essentially it has all the three kinds of the fibers which we have just now mentioned and that is why you must remember this keyword ventral ramus of a spinal nerve contributes to the plexus formation for the limbs what does the dorsal ramus do it goes to the back okay and they supply the back muscles the back skin okay they supply all these kind of things dorsal rami supply the back muscles and the skin over it okay and they do not contribute in our plexus formation now in this diagram you can see the cross section of the spinal cord and this is the central canal of the spinal cord this is the ventral part this is the dorsal part you can see the ventral root is the motor root which we have just now seen it is carrying fibers away from that spinal cord or the cns okay spinal cord is a part of cns now you see another root entering into the spinal cord it is bringing the impulses to the spinal cord this is your dorsal root it also has a dorsal root ganglion which is the collection of a few cell bodies which are contributing to this root okay but essentially you have to notice two things here the ventral root and the dorsal root which are exclusive this is the sensory this is the motor but together they unite to form the spinal nerve is it clear and you have another portion in the t1 to l2 l3 level and this contribute to the autonomic component and they relay themselves in a sympathetic ganglia the chain sympathetic chain which is there in your trunk and this part which is from t1 to l2 l3 level in your spinal cord has the sympathetic component the one which is going to that ganglion is a myelinated one and that carries the fibers away from that cns again and this is known as white ramus communicans or this is the white ramus for your better understanding you just see this this is a branch coming from that nerve it appears as if it's a branch of spinal nerve and yes it is indeed 
but these are only the fibers of the sympathetic nervous system that are carried with this spinal nerve and they are coming back to this nerve in a unmyelinated fashion and it goes with ventral ramus as well as the dorsal ramus see this they are away going fibers which are known as the gray rami communicants and they spread along with the whatever spinal nerve is going everywhere they go and they supply the the sympathetic fibers mainly to the glands to the smooth muscle okay to the skin they all supply the fiber and that's why they are also the part of your plexuses but books don't you know uh, i would say focus too much on this and this is a little bit confusing part that's why in many books it is not too much clearly given and uh, people initially don't understand that much of this communicants white and gray ramus white is myelinated component or the part that is pre ganglionic part of your sympathetic fiber and this post ganglionic part is the unmyelinated in large cases and this is going along with the spinal nerve so essentially what we have on our card now is the spinal nerve with the mixed nature of fibers we have away going fibers of this ventral root which are motor fibers which have incoming fibers from the different senses different organs different areas that are going to the posterior part of your spinal cord and we also have few of the sympathetic fibers which are bundled together in the spinal nerve and now this nerve divides largely into the ventral ramus and the dorsal ramus skip this for for the day we are dealing with only this ventral ramus of the five nerves c5 c6 c7 c8 and t1 c5 to c8 we have eight cervical spinal nerves the c5 to c8 gives ventral ramus and they contribute into the brachial plexus formation as well as t1 this is very key ramus t1 spinal nerve ramus also contribute that is the last ramus normally to contribute into the brachial plexus you may have a prefixed brachial plexus in which you will have contribution from the c4 and there is a minimal contribution from the t1 okay because it is going one segment up in the spinal cord it will contributed mainly by the c4 to then c8 and t1 will have a minimal or non significant contribution in another type of brachial plexus you may have large contribution from the lower segment that is the t1 and t2 t1 is generally there but t2 if it is getting involved in a huge proportion we will call that kind of plexus as the post fixed brachial plexus because it will have one extra rather displaced lower displaced brachial plexus in a segment from c6 to t2 but normal segmentation of your brachial plexus which is contributed by the spinal nerve ventral rami of c5 to c5 to t1 this is what we have in a brachial plexus so what is brachial plexus actually is a network of the nerves that supply your upper limb musculature it also have some muscles of the back and chest wall supplied by it because they contribute to the upper limb okay the movement of the upper limb are you know produced by this back and chest wall muscle that is why this plexus also supplies those muscles okay and it's formed by the nerve roots just now we have seen c5 c6 c7 c8 and t1 if it involves c4 then it is called as prefixed brachial plexus if it involves larger part of the t2 then it is called as post fixed brachial plexus it is homologous to something in the lower limbs in the lumbosacral region you have similar kind of plexus called as lumbosacral plexus so i hope it is clear what is brachial plexus what contributes to the formation of the brachial plexus and now we'll see the particular arrangement of that 
nerves and how do they form our plexus what are the parts of the brachial plexus this is very commonly asked question and this parts will always be asked whether in the theory or in the practicals you will be asked repeatedly about the parts of the brachial plexus what are the parts they have roots okay first part is the root then you have the trunks then you have the divisions then you have the cords then you have the branches okay so first part is the root then you have the trunks then you have the divisions then you have the cords then you have the branches and it is very much synonymous or homologous to a pattern of the tree which is in a transverse orientation in a horizontal orientation rather because if you compare your spinal cord and the roots of your spinal nerve they are actually the roots of the tree then you have a thick trunk formed by the different roots then you have again that trunk trunk dividing into some divisions then you have those divisions again giving some cords you know and then you have the terminal branches which are bearing something over that and they are producing actually the movements of the the innervated parts here the upper limbs so this is the concept of brachial plexus from the roots to the branches what are the intermediaries roots trunk divisions cords and the branches okay so this is how your cords gives rise to the branches and the cords are more more famous because of the various reasons you are going to know in this lecture later on okay so they will give the branches and they will supply the muscles of the upper limb so this is your brachial plexus cords now see this is a very simple diagram and you have to draw this this is a must know you cannot skip this part this is a must have diagram in your arsenal because without understanding this diagram and without drawing this diagram you will not you will never get the full marks for this question and if you don't understand this diagram you will not never attempt even the brachial plexus and uh, this is a high probability question so i would uh, suggest you you first master this diagram so just now we have seen the five parts the roots the trunks the divisions the cords and the branches and this is your horizontally arranged parts of a hypothetical tree in a nervous form so these are all you can see the five roots c5 c6 c7 c8 and t1 you join the upper two roots you join the lower two roots and you keep your middle root continue as one of the division uh, one of the trunk so essentially how many trunks you have now three trunks five roots giving rise to three trunks and upper two gives rise to the upper trunk the middle continues c7 is very powerful remember this c7 continues as the middle trunk just to maintain the symmetry i guess to make things simpler for you c7 continues in the middle as the middle trunk c8 t1 is the lower trunk and further again they divide into two two parts symmetry maintain thankfully and these two two parts are nothing but the anterior and posterior anterior and posterior anterior and posterior divisions of the respective trunks okay so this part is comparatively easy okay we'll come to the other parts little bit later but first you understand the half part of your half part of your brachial plexus it's quite you know easier to understand c5 to c6 one that is upper trunk again dividing into anterior and posterior division middle c7 continuing as the middle trunk again dividing into anterior posterior division c8 t1 
forming the lower trunk and this will continue dividing into anterior and posterior division now they have to regroup again around the axillary artery that you must have seen the axillary artery by now and you know that axillary artery has an intimate relationship with this quads so these divisions anterior posterior they arrange rearrange themselves in a way that they form three quads likewise here with three trunks here you have three quads but the name are different lateral cord posterior cord and the medial cord lateral is formed by the anterior and the anterior that is the anterior divisions of the upper and middle trunk contribute to the lateral cord the anterior division of the lower trunk you know it continues it contributes to the medial cord okay and all the posterior divisions shown here with the red color you have the posterior divisions of all the trunks they are forming your posterior cord and arguably the largest cord the thickest cord is the posterior cord of the brachial plexus now why these names lateral posterior and medial why not anterior is included there because these cords are formed or given this directional name with respect to the second part of your axillary artery your lateral cord is lateral to the second part medial cord is medial to the second part of the axillary artery and posterior cord is the posterior to the axillary artery that is why they have medial cord posterior cord lateral cord names this is strictly in accordance with the relationship of the second part of the axillary artery if you don't know pectoralis minor divides your axillary into axillary artery into first the second part and the third part the proximal the deep and the distal part you can go for the video over the axillary and axillary artery if you have not visited that part okay now this cord further divides into respective branches which supply your upper limb okay see the lateral cord gives first very thin branch called as lateral pectoral nerve it has another branch given called as musculo cutaneous nerve and it has its continuation into the lateral root of median nerve and this will contribute to one of the large branch of your upper limb called as median nerve you must have seen this by now the median nerve how it looks into the dissection hall if not when you see you will definitely understand it's one of the very large branch of your upper limb and this is contributed by the two cords one is the lateral cord and the other is the medial cord now your medial cord which is the continuation of the anterior division of your lower trunk gives five branches medial pectoral nerve medial cutaneous nerve of arm medial cutaneous nerve of forearm the medial root of median nerve which is considered as a continuation of this cord and the largest branch of that is the ulna nerve so this is the branch of the medial cord now see if you observe your body our medial part is you know inferiorly the lateral part is superiorly so there is a catch here your upper portion of the brachial plexus your upper portion of the brachial plexus is contributed by c5 c6 similarly the nerves arising from those portion will have largely c5 c6 nerve root value initially the student find it very difficult to remember the root values of few of the nerves so this is a logic here okay it's a logical thing and you can just answer like that it won't be wrong
okay will be more or less right what is the catch the upper part nerves here what is that lateral pectoral nerve muscular cutaneous nerve lateral root of median nerve this is arising largely from the upper part i have skipped this part because we are going to deal with this very shortly even all these nerves they have the major root values called as c5 c6 you will have mcqs over this and this is very logical okay upper part superior part lateral part lateral quad branches they have the root value of c5 c6 okay this is done your lateral pectoral nerve also have the root value c5 c6 okay c7 may get its value okay because it also have a anterior part so lateral pectoral nerve will also have c7 5 6 7 but largely this upper part contributes to the the lateral cord okay now you come to the medial cord similarly it will have all the values of the lower part of that roots and this is your c8 t1 occasional contribution by c7 if it is not contributed you know in this area that will go with this area so c7 is a transition zone okay we would say that is not a large contributor to the nerves but it is a accessory and important okay so you have to add c7 at times so c8 and t1 is these are the major contributors for this medial cord is it clear and medial cord has medial pectoral nerve the root value will be again the c8 t1 medial cutaneous nerve of arm again it has a root value of c8 okay the arm will have t1 the arm has the t1 root value medial cutaneous nerve of four forearm has large contribution from the c8 ulnar has contribution of large contribution of both this c8 t1 and it also borrows few fibers from a communicating branch if it is not given here only it gets the communication largely from the c7 also if it is not given in this trunk it is given by this root it's a communicating branch coming to the ulna nerve many of the book shows that okay so it has some contribution from the c7 correct so c7 c8 t1 but if you observe you will understand the lower roots contribute to the medial cord the upper root contributes to the lateral cord so root values become little bit easier to remember okay so this is how you have to you know just master those root value and how the nerves are formed so again we'll uh, see that three nerves arising from the lateral cord lateral pectoral nerve the muscular cutaneous nerve and the lateral root of median nerve five nerves arising from the medial cord medial pectoral nerve medial cutaneous nerve of arm medial cutaneous nerve of forearm the ulna nerve largest branch and the continuation of that cord is the medial root of median nerve form just in front of the axillary artery which is there now see thankfully posterior cords very similar posterior divisions of all the trunks they contribute in the formation of the posterior cord and it again have five branches largest of them and considered as a continuation of that cord is the radial nerve it has all the root value c5 to t1 union of your lateral and medial root of median nerve it also have all the root value c5 to t1 so remember so someone ask you about the root value of median and radial nerve similar but the divisions are different remember this one contains the anterior divisions and the other contains the posterior divisions with a similar root value what does it mean the radial nerve is mainly the nerve of the extensor compartment on the back of your arm forearm and this is your radial nerve and median nerve basically is your nerve of the front compartment okay forearm mainly 
and musculocutaneous and ulnar you can say they are the detached part of all these anterior fibers again contributing to the front of your arm forearm and ventral side of the your upper limb so i hope you are now understanding how they are arranged how the roots form the trunk how the trunk are dividing into two two parts how these two parts have anterior anterior uniting two anterior upper anterior uniting into the lateral cord the lower anterior continuing as the medial cord and all the posterior divisions they are contributing to the posterior cord now what does this posterior cord supply it has mainly the supply of the extensor compartment and back muscles which are again largely considered as the extensor muscles upper subscapular middle subscapular or thoracodorsal nerve okay some books mention the thoracodorsal nerve as the middle subscapular nerve so upper subscapular middle or thoracodorsal nerve middle subscapular and lower subscapular these nerves arise as very short nerves they supply your subscapularis muscle they supply the lower upper middle and lower portion of the subscapularis while it goes your thoracodorsal nerve also supply that muscle and it supplies the latissimus dorsi at the end thoracodorsal nerve this middle your lower subscapular will also contribute little bit to the teres major muscle many of the times your teres major and teres minor muscle are the candidate for the mcqs because you know teres major is supplied by lower subscapular nerve and your this nerve called as axillary nerve you must have seen this if you have dissected the brachial plexus this nerve supplies a very important muscle in the upper limb called as deltoid so deltoid is supplied by axillary and this nerve also contribute to the teres minor muscle all the short muscle and their actions and everything will be dealt later in our respective sessions but remember posterior cord supplies this region with the scapular muscles and few muscles of the back radial nerve supplying all your back of arm forearm like triceps all the extensor compartment of your forearm and the back of your hand even the skin this all contributed by the radial nerve now radial nerve is considered as a continuation of the posterior cord the medial nerve its continuation of the lateral and the medial cord because these two roots are the continuation lateral is a continuation of lateral cord the medial is continuation of the medial cord okay now there are things to notice in this brachial plexus this is a very famous yum pattern form in the brachial plexus again a horizontal yum so one limb is formed by the musculocutaneous nerve the middle vertical or oblique portions are formed by the medial median now that is the lateral root of median and the medial root of median now and another vertical limb okay medial is formed by the ulnar nerve so ulnar nerve musculocutaneous at the lateral portion and the middle portion is formed by the median nerve so this is your m pattern of the brachial plexus now come to our upper trunk now this upper trunk has a particular area where c5 c6 unite to form the upper trunk they gives two branches here suprascapular nerve and the nerve to subclavius muscle suprascapular supplies your supraspinatus infraspinatus and this supplies your subclavius and further this trunk divides into anterior and posterior division so in all you have one Two, three, four, five, six nerves uniting together at this point, and this is called as Arps point. And this is a very common site of injury in the different clinical scenarios. Okay, and that's why 
this becomes important you know where is herbs point there's a famous short note called as herbs paralysis repeatedly you will see the question over that herbs paralysis also known as herbs duchenne paralysis okay so herbs paralysis is this point where there, if there is a damage you will have a set of clinical symptoms scenarios that will arise okay so this is how you have to draw the brachial plexus you cannot miss out on the branches of the roots of the brachial plexus five roots upper three contribute c5 c6 c7 contributes to a big nerve supplying your upper thoracic wall muscle called as serratus anterior the nerve is a long thoracic nerve the root value will be c5 c6 c7 okay so pras capillar will have c5 c6 nodus subclavius will have c5 c6 okay there will be the uh, the root values for this radial will have everything c5 to t1 axillary will have c5 c6 lower subscapular okay lower subscapular again it will have the middle value c6 c7 okay even it may have t1 it will not have but c6 c7 okay because remember c8 t1 they are basically meant for the the medial portion of your upper limb okay so they won't go there upper subscapular will have c5 c6 or c6 c7 all these will have the same okay middle subscapular you know what does it have c6 c7 okay c8 6 7 8 this is your there's a descending order of root value for this three nerves long thoracic nerve 5 6 7 middle uh, middle subscapular or thoracodorsal nerve will have c 6 c 7 c 8 and your ulnar nerve will have c 7 c 8 t 1 so these three nerves you won't forget okay 5 6 7 for the long thoracic nerve nerve that is c6 c7 c8 for this thoracodorsal nerve and 7 8 t1 for the ulnar nerve now you have another branch from this c5 coming and that is called as dorsal scapular nerve this is again a branch coming from the root of the brachial plexus many of the books now are including now to subclavius arising from 5 6 roots only so refer to your newer books what do they say and write accordingly okay but we consider this as a is a nerve arising of this upper trunk okay many books now are considering this as c5 c6 okay to phrenic nerve you have a small contribution from the c5 because phrenic nerve has a root value of c3 c4 c5 that's a nerve that supplies your diaphragm It's very important inspiratory muscle that is supplied by the phrenic nerve having the root value C3, C4, C5. C4 is the major root, and a minor contribution from the C5 is also going there. Now many of the books mention this nerve fibers to the phrenic nerve as a component of the brachial plexus, but many books don't mention it at all. Again, refer to what you are referring and follow the same. Okay. but don't miss out dorsal scapular exclusively from the c5 supplies your back muscles again retractors of the scapula called as rhomboids rhomboids minor rhomboids major levator scapulae all are supplied by the dorsal scapula now 6 7 you know c8 this is your thoracodorsal supplying your latissimus dorsi again back muscles and ulna now supplies the medial part of your forearm few of the muscles there and intrinsic muscles of the hand hand ke jo chote chote muscle hote the smaller muscles they are all supplied by the ulnar nerve okay so remember this diagram carries big weightage two marks at least or more so four marks of the brachial plexus are given to this diagram and the formation and everything okay so remember this now we will see the lateral cord and its branches just a quick revision and 
its root values okay you will have to mention this so as to get your full marks of the formation and the branches of the brachial plexus so anterior division of the upper and the middle trunks forms the lateral cord and they have major root values as c5 c6 c7 c5 c6 is the major contributor okay lateral pectoral nerve c5 c6 c7 this nerve supplies your pectoral muscles it gives a communicating branch to your medial pectoral nerve which goes anterior to the axillary artery in the relationship of the axillary artery first part this will come there it joins with the medial pectoral nerve and it, then it pierces together the pectoralis minor after it supplies that muscle it supplies your pectoralis major so lateral pectoral nerve so first branch small branch important one okay chest musculo pectoral musculo cutaneous nerve musculo cutaneous nerve very important and very easy to find and remember as it supplies your coracobrachialis it pierces it it supplies the biceps the brachioradialis both the muscles of your arm the arm muscles biceps brach you know brachialis coracobrachialis after piercing it it gives a branch before piercing but it pierces through it and then it goes deep to your brach you know biceps brachii it also supplies that biceps brachii and brachialis muscle and further it will continue as the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm mcq point where they repeatedly ask about musculoskeletal cutaneous nerve being you know uh, continued into that forearm cutaneous nerve lateral part okay and this is why the cutaneous in that uh, title lateral root of the median nerve it's it is actually the continuation of the lateral cord c5 c6 c7 okay it joins with the medial root coming from the medial cord and together it will continue down anterior to your axillary artery into the nerve and further it will cross in the arm to the brachial artery medially you find it in the cubital fossa so all this is a median nerve so lateral cord contributes to the lateral root and it is the continuation of that lateral cord down okay so remember lateral cord is related laterally to the second part of the axillary artery and these two are related laterally to that artery whereas this root crosses the artery from the front side in the third part okay remember that it is convenient to study the medial cord after the lateral okay because you know you can compare the opposite it is formed by the anterior division of the lower trunk we'll say lower trunk is more powerful only the anterior division gives one cord okay and the c7 c8 and t1 are the major contributors the c7 c8 and t1 okay medial pectoral nerve c8 t1 value medial cutaneous nerve of the arm t1 major contributor there it, they will have overlapping fibers or accessory fibers coming from the c8 also but t1 is the major contributor because your arm medial part is contributed by t1 and partly it also gave gets the contribution from that intercostal brachial nerve that is t2 okay so remember this medial cutaneous nerve of the arm floor of the axilla in the medial part upper medial part of the arm is supplied by this lower is supplied by the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm also gives some fibers to that uh, you know lower part of your arm c8 is the major contributor to that nerve and it supplies the medial margin of your forearm medial part of that anterior aspect mainly okay medial root of median nerve just now we have seen c8 t1 value lower part joins with the our lateral root to form that big median nerve also known as a laborer's nerve because this nerve supplies the big forearm muscles flexors of the wrist fingers big bulkier muscles on your from the, the front of the forearm they are all supplied you know 90% of the muscle are supplied by this median nerve ulnar nerve c7 c8 t1 value 
and this is very important now for the musicians and that is why this is also known as musician's nerve and this applies the intrinsic muscles of the hand your all wavy movements very thread like very fine movements of your fingers are under the control of this ulna nerve okay so this is very important that you understand the ulna nerve and the root value of that is the c7 c8 t1 now i am i feel that you understand what i mean by uh, root value because root value are important because you know from where the fibers are coming so if that root of that particular spinal nerve is getting involved you will understand where can be the effect of that injury okay that is why these root values are important posterior cord the largest of the cords and it has contribution from all the roots c5 to t1 posterior divisions of all the trunks they contribute they unite to form this posterior cord and you will have upper subscapular nerve lower subscapular nerve thoracodorsal nerve axillary nerve radial nerve as the five branches you know they have some mnemonics for this but uh, you understand concepts you remember it for the long time you cannot be wrong there okay if you just give mnemonic and you, you may confuse between the branches then okay and that will just cut down your marks i forget about, about the marks you all of you are going to be professionals i believe knowing the basics and knowing what can affect the person is very important for you not the marks for now for now you should focus on the concepts building your knowledge in your head you should understand what is happening with the patient what is normal what is abnormal and if something is going wrong if this nerve gets wrong where it can go wrong what it can produce okay that is very important so the posterior cord is uh, contributed by your all the roots and upper subscapular as i said upper portion have the upper roots c5 c6 you will you will see lower subscapular even that now arises very early so c5 c6 middle thoracic or middle thoracodorsal or we'll call middle subscapular nerve huh? sister of all these two or the thoracodorsal nerve this is a major nerve or we'll say it has a supply to our latissimus dorsi muscle thoracodorsal nerve goes to that muscle okay it is uh, the big back muscle okay axillary nerve c5 c6 and this is very important key nerve that supplies the deltoid and also gives a small branch to the teres minor your lower subscapular gives a branch to the teres major remember these two as mcq candidates radial nerve supplies back of arm back of forearm and the skin of the hand the posterior part mainly the lateral portion okay so radial nerve all the roots c5 c8 and t1 by far this is the thickest nerve the radial nerve is the thickest nerve in the brachial plexus the smallest nerve is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm medial cutaneous nerve of the arm see this particular relationships of the parts of the brachial plexus or for that matter relations of the brachial plexus can be a subheading in the laq many of the people have a tendency to you know put this in a laq that is not too much well mentioned in the books you should understand whatever is given and whatever is mentioned and which are the key relations of that brachial plexus for two marks first thing you know you can draw or you can divide your brachial plexus into two parts one is supraclavicular above the clavicle and one is infraclavicular now few books mention it behind the clavicular as the retroclavicular part also now what are those parts so if you remember our five parts five parts are the roots the trunks the divisions the cords and the branches you know the upper part is in the neck lower part is in the axilla that is where all our brachial plexus is 
now see roots in the trunks they are in the neck even the divisions are in the neck root trunks divisions are in the neck and as you descend down from the neck likewise they are there roots trunks divisions behind the clavicle you have formation of the cords so behind the clavicle there is a division forming together into the cord or they come together to form that cord and in the axilla you have the cords surrounding your axillary artery and the branches of the cords surrounding the third part and descending down into the upper limb arm so this is your brachial plexus and the relations okay we'll go through it the relations the root trunks and divisions are present in the neck in the respective descending order the trunks arise between the anterior and middle scalene muscle this is important relation in the neck you should always mention it the trunks will arise the trunks of the brachial plexus between the two muscles of the neck anterior and middle skeleton muscle so you can write behind the anterior skeleton muscle there are the trunks of the brachial plexus they'll come out they'll form the divisions and the divisions will run into the neck behind the clavicle they will unite to form the cords so cords begin behind the clavicle lower portion and these cords and the branches of the brachial plexus are present in the axilla you know the cords of the brachial plexus are in intimate relationship with the first and second part of the axillary artery i have highlighted the portion where you should mention what is present and the relations neck in the axilla and around the axillary artery that will fetch you two marks if it is a subheading the cords of the brachial plexus are intimately related to the axillary artery second part of the axillary artery you have to mention because this gives the name to the cords whether it's a lateral whether it's a posterior whether it's a medial and they are related with the respective to their names like posterior cord is posterior to the artery second part of the artery medial is medial to the art uh, that uh, second part of the artery and lateral is lateral to the second part of the artery the third part of the artery is related to the branches of the cords of the brachial plexus okay medial ki branches medially lateral ki branches laterally union of lateral medial and anteriorly median now posterior ki branches posteriorly so this is how you should mention the relations of the parts of the brachial plexus what is herbs point and what is the herbs paralysis is it important to know it very important because this is a repeatedly asked short note out of this or paralysis if someone want to skip the laq over the uh, brachial plexus he will go for the or she will go for the or paralysis they will test your knowledge about the brachial plexus anyway it's a point on the upper trunk where six nerves are united or attached okay it's a union or arisal of these six nerves on the upper trunk and what are those six nerves which are united there c5 c6 nerve roots suprascapular nerve going to the back of your scapula through that suprascapular notch now to the subclavius supplying a very flat very small muscle just below the clavicle called a subclavius anterior and posterior division of the upper trunk contributing to the different cords of the brachial plexus so anterior and posterior division and hyper extension of your shoulder and neck region so between the neck and the shoulder if there is a hyper extension like this too much in accidental case at the birth of a baby if this is happening it will lead lead to that point where you get injury to the upper trunk and this contributes to the herbs duquesne paralysis okay so this is herbs paralysis and this is the cause 
hyper extension between the shoulder and neck and i'll call it as neck okay neck hyper extension you have to remember the neck hyper extension or the over extension over stretching or sudden impact over this area of the neck lower portion particularly it will lead to the paralysis called as herb's paralysis now this is your herb's point c5 c6 nerve roots suprascapular nerve nerve to subclavius and the anterior and posterior divisions they all contribute here so this is your herb's paralysis or herb's point where if there's a damage here you get the herb's paralysis what are the deformities which is there again very key important things you have to mention in a short note this roots in order c5 c6 mainly muscles in all and movements lost for the same muscles are the biceps black i i said upper is upper remember 5 6 okay and generally there is a rule okay remember this as a as a hint that the upper roots supply the proximal muscles okay this will hint you some of the root values again the upper roots c5 c6 supply the upper that is the proximal portion of your limb called as arm so arm is basically supplied by c5 c6 roots as you go down you have c6 uh, c7 c8 and t1 involved and that too in this direction like from the lateral to the medial they go c uh, say c5 c6 c7 c8 t1 okay so remember upper part supplied by c5 c6 and in the herb's paralysis these are the muscles say biceps deltoid brachialis brachioradialis and partly supraspinatus even again infraspinatus because you have suprascapular nerve involved there and supinator okay some fibers of the radial nerve again c5 c6 they are supplying supinator so these fibers are involved that is why the arm is hanging by the side that means they are not able to abduct the arm because deltoid is involved so adduction will be the position of the arm medially rotated because these lateral rotators are gone supraspinatus and infraspinatus are gone and the forearm will be the extended because your biceps is gone brachialis is gone brachioradialis is gone it will be pronated because supinator is gone so all these are the deformities and the you know the movements lost in that herb's paralysis and such a position of the hand where it is hanging by the side and you know if the flexors are gone it will be in this adducted and pronated position so as to accept the tip It is known as policeman's tip hand this is policeman's tip hand or the waiter's tip hand or the porter's tip hand all accepting the tip so it is the tip hand okay this is another paralysis that is possible clumkey's paralysis your lower trunk if it is involved in a injury to the brachial plexus in over abduction of the arm now here i will focus on the arm because the arm is over abducted like this and this is stretching your lower trunk okay over abduction of the arm if upper part is involved it will be the upper trunk if this is happening this will press upon this lower trunk and this will you know make this clumkey's paralysis in that person so over abduction of the arm in an adult in cases of accident or in the forceps delivery this is possible or a shoulder dystocia i would say where the shoulder is not you know coming out normally in that labor process birth process this may happen called as clumkey's paralysis the nerve roots mainly involved are t1 and partly it is c8 so as i said ulnar nerve will be involved because c8 and t1 is for the ulnar nerve okay clinically you can test it with the ulnar nerve 
what are the muscles involved intrinsic muscles of the hand supplied by the ulnar nerve and the ulnar flexors of the wrist and the fingers which are supplied by c8 so intrinsic muscles are supplied by t1 component all the musicians use these fingers and these movements will be at the risk if there is a clum case paralysis what is the deformity produced because of this is the complete claw hand okay the it will lead to the complete claw hand because of the that joining fibers of the other muscles in the because their trunk is involved and you will have the similar fibers which are you know coming into the median now as well so complete near complete claw hand will be observed in the clump case paralysis there will be the anesthesia and analgesia along the medial border of the forearm and the hand that is supplied by the ulna nerve and this is mainly remember claw hand and clump case paralysis go hand in hand if there is a lower trunk injury you will have claw hand and it mainly affects the ulna nerve okay this is your lower trunk c8 t1 c8 and t1 joining to form that lower trunk further it gives anterior posterior division now see anterior division further gives you big branch and none now having the main contribution of c8 and t1 they'll be under the threat if there is a damage here and you will also have something called as horner syndrome because t1 gets your sympathetic started so sympathetic if they are involved in this nerve trunk injury that is the lower trunk and they are not able to give the fibers to the cervical ganglion which is you know giving fibers to that head neck face that will be under the again uh, you know injury and this will lead to the some symptoms in the head neck face called as tosis of the eye tosis is the drooping of the eyelid because this is controlled by the sympathetic there will be the loss of ciliary reflex your pupil will be small pupil called as meiosis so the meiosis pinpoint pupil tosis anhydrosis loss of sweating because of sympathetic is lost sweat glands won't for function properly and that is why there is this syndrome called as horner syndrome where you will also have deep eyeball in of thalamus it is known as deepening of the eyeball socket so because it is not functioning properly it is undergo little bit of atrophy type trophic changes in that eyeball so this is horner syndrome produced by the disruption in this sympathetic to the head neck face because of the t1 is involved in the clump case paralysis so along with this upper limb symptoms that is involving the ulnar nerve if you have some symptoms there which are also visible in the eyeball you straight way know that there is a injury to the lower trunk in the neck there is something wrong in the lower neck okay it will straight way give you the diagnosis of that person and this will be the clump case paralysis now i have been saying that this question of brachial plexus is very important and this is a pattern how the question is formatted and i believe uh, more or less this will be the things coming in your exams if the brachial plexus comes as a laq 8 or 10 marks you know it depends formation four marks where you have to draw that diagram of five roots how they form the trunk the divisions the cords the branches what are the branches enumeration with the root values proper diagram what are the relations in the neck in the axilla behind the clavicle you have to mention you know what is the applied anatomy two or four marks because they have big two syndromes there of paralysis you have to write you have to mention what is lost why it is lost you have to mention the clump case paralysis as well So if you write this clinical anatomy with the all the right kind of diagrams, you will not be, you know, you will not feel any stress about this brachial plexus, 
and surely you will get maximum marks try reading from the books revise if you don't understand anything just message just comment on our channel wish you luck do hard work we'll see you again i'll see you again in the next big chapter okay thank you so much